good evening everybody um you're very welcome to this evening's let's talk equine i uh, really appreciate your uh your camaraderie this evening on the the discussion with us and appreciate everybody being here with us um i have two very experienced ladies here with me this evening uh, alicia devlin Byrne with the lovely wicklow hills behind her and uh Neve Melody of Nara Valley Connemaris, um, with also her homeland na- landscape in behind her and the lovely Nara Valley. Ladies, you're both very welcome this evening and really appreciate you giving your time to be with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, look, looking forward to the discussion with you both this evening and learning a little bit more about your your stories and that most most particularly that of your horses as well and your ponies. Um, that's what we're all here to to listen and uh, learn about. And I suppose you know, aside from the interest in the horses and the ponies, there is another kind of um. Uh, a neat little little uh, bit of commonality, I suppose, between both of you as well, in that you are both um, in the role of education and teaching, and uh, I suppose it 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 gives you the the spare time at certain times of the year to be able to um, follow your other pursuit and joy and uh, the 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 um, equine pursuits alongside that. So I suppose maybe if I come to you, um, Alicia, first, you you happen to be on the top of my screen. Um, <laughs> maybe just from from the perspective of giving people a little bit of an insight, those there's a lot here, I'm sure we'll know, we'll know both of you this evening. But um, for those that maybe don't, to give a little bit of an introduction from the perspective of what your enterprise at home, what it looks like, the kind of size, the number of horses that you tend to carry and work. And and I suppose maybe a little bit of just like it's not just you there as well, too. So maybe if you could could give us a little bit of an insight into that. Yeah. Um, yeah so we are we're a family yard. And um, as you said, I am a teacher. So most of the year I'm teaching. But luckily for the summers that um, I get off, I can compete um, throughout the year. Both um, my parents do a lot of work in the yard and keep horses going um, and ponies going and, and taking over when I, when I can't, when I'm working. Um, but it is great to have the holidays um, from teaching because it does help um, in the preparation for competitions during the summer. And then also we have the summer that I had the summer then to compete. Um, when I'm competing, I mostly compete in Irish drafts and Connemara's and, and crosses usually. And um, there is, um, I mostly do showing and working hunter and performance classes and some slide paddle. And um, so it's mostly the, the showing um, circuit that I would be on. I do, you know, do a bit of everything in terms of just getting experience and mileage on horses um, and ponies. So in the winter, I'd be hunting and doing a, bit, a little bit of dressage and show jumping and cross country just to get round in the education experience. Yeah. 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 And I suppose, look, our topic this evening, I should have said, is um, is nurturing natives and native crosses. And, you know, in that, I suppose we're looking at a twofold. We're looking at a one from the perspective of you as the producer and two coming next to Neve from the perspective of of a breeder um, and coming from that that uh, long, longer experience in the, the world of breeding. So Neve, um, coming to yourself, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about Nara Valley Connemara's and, you know, what that means in the sense of the size of the enterprise and maybe how long you've been involved and Pony's been involved in, in the family. Um, I suppose we're more, we're more scaled back now than we've ever been, but uh, we've been breeding Connemara ponies for 30 years but before that uh, we were breeding Irish drafts so I have a very uh, people always associate I remember I met somebody during the summertime are you still breeding Connemara's and I was yes I was like so uh, obviously people know us for breeding Connemara's but we did breed Irish drafts prior to that and when I was younger and up until about 20 years ago we used to have a trekking centre here in the Nara Valley Fabulous place, fantastic place to go hill walking for anyone who wants to go hill walking. It's great. She and, works for uh, Paul Ireland as well, I should have said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. We've been busy promoting the Nar Valley for many, many years. So yeah. we'd like to keep doing it. But uh, with the ponies, then we always had, as part of the trekking, we had 
you know, Cobbs and Connemara's and Irish drafts as part of them. And Teddy and Happy were our first ever Connemara's without any books, but you'd know they were Connemara's by looking at them. And then we got a mayor and that began the whole story of Connemara's in the Nar Valley. And we've been doing so it now it's for 30 been a, years. A, a family journey as such, you know. Oh, completely. I mean, without my parents are there at home the whole time. They're looking after everything every day. I'm there most days, but not every day. And without them, it wouldn't have continued for the length of time that it has continued for. And I'm very grateful to both of them for all that they've done over all the years and are continuing to do. Yeah. But uh, we've scaled back the operation. We just have, we've only one mayor in full for next year. We're down to just a couple of mayors and we've two yearlings coming on as well, but that's later. Yeah, we'll get to see all but, the we go through. Yeah. So I suppose, look, you know, it's suffice to say at this point in time, both of you have achieved a fair, you know, throttle of rosettes and successes over the years either directly or through the the progeny that you've produced and maybe sometimes in the hands of others and and all of that with your with your own situation as well Neve and your and through yourselves too but um I suppose there's there's been that like kind of um I suppose lo- long going history with both of you to be able to to come to us this evening and talk a little bit around you know what you see as being the positives of the natives um, and and that story is going to unfold as we go through. So I just want to say as well to our audience this evening, uh, if those if there's any of you that are new to us and haven't been on Let's Talk Equine before, I very much welcome your questions and your interaction. I'll try to keep an eye on both screens here, left and right of me. So if you see my head bobbing, that's what I'm doing here. Um, and uh, we appreciate the questions coming in and we'll get to them at intervals um, through the conversation. Um, I do have um, a, a slideshow because we very much have trying to bring the animals to your screen this evening um, in that the, the, the ladies were, were very good in producing and sending on some um, visuals for us to work through to talk about the ponies and the horses here this evening. So um, I think without further ado, I'll get into that um, screen share. Um, just to say as well, for those of you who may try to use the um, the chat function, please use, it's the Q&A function on your screen that um, I'd invite you to use. Okay, because I can't, um, I cannot um, see the other. Right, we're ready to go. So um, just before we get going, just a little acknowledgement there, because there are a lot of photos and we we um, we do want to acknowledge where they, they have been, been um, supplied. So, um, um, okay, so firstly, coming to you, um, Alicia, I suppose um, for an awful lot of people out there, um, this guy uh, doesn't need a lot of introduction. He's um, been around quite a while at this point. Um, born in 1997, uh, Blackwood Fernando. I think you refer to him as Fred, am I right? Fred, yeah. And... Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he's he is one in a million. <laughs> um, and as you said, like, he, he is known, um, I suppose, countrywide and I suppose anyone who follows Connemara's and, and showing probably know him worldwide as well and um, I've been lucky to be riding him since I was 12 okay, <laughs> so, so we have grown up together yeah so he would have been what age at the point when you started to to um ride him um he was nine okay. Um, I, I competed him for a year when he was nine um for his owner at the time Jill Glynn mm-hmm. um and then he went back to her the following year. I competed him once as a 10 year old and then we bought him in the winter of his 10 year old year. So tell us about um, Fred. Like he, what what made what made makes Fred Fred and what's what are the positive traits as you see them about Fred? Um he is he's a very athletic pony. Um despite he like in terms of showing he has kind of everything that you would want for a show animal and um, he's fantastic movement he's great confirmation but he also has the 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 attitude and, and temperament to compete and um, he, he he i would describe him as the ultimate showman in that he loves the crowd he can go out to the arena here and he'll hack around and 
you kind of you do a double take on him and kind of go, God, is he really like as good as you say? And then he steps into the ring, and once he steps into the ring, his game is on, and he knows he's on the job. And um, so it's it's a really nice, and um, he's just he's the desire to do what you want. Like he he's the desire to please, and um, and I think that comes across in a lot of the native breeds as well. And uh, I suppose, you know, he's so he's he's definitely shown his versatility and his ability to adapt to different jobs. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so he he's really great in in terms of he he's been very successful in both a, a ridden career on the flat and also um, in jumping. So he would have been um, ridden champion in in Dublin and Clifton um and Balmoral on on a few occasions in Balmoral, in Balmoral um and he's also um working hunter champion in Dublin Clifton Balmoral um and also um in England as well he would he also got to do um that it's the middle picture there with the the blue poles and that was actually him competing in the main ring in the RDS um as in the in a team chase so he was using his speed and jumping there and so he's not just a pretty face and he also does the he's also won the pre and clifton as well and so he has he's shown his his serious scope in in those classes too and I suppose, like, did you, would you have known his, his mother or do you, did you know the, the background of the breed, of the breeding? No, unfortunately, unfortunately not. He is actually the first, um, Connemara pony that I competed. Mm-hmm. We, we were, um, we had wanted to get a Connemara pony when I was on 13 handers, but it was very difficult to find one and I didn't get one. Um, I ended up on it with the Welsh pony. Um, but, um, I was asked to compete Fred when I was I think I was 12 um, so he would have been the first Connemara that I actually competed mm-hmm. lucky yeah. lucky for me I suppose you are very lucky yeah and he's still with you yeah. all these, all these years later for a, a testament to his soundness as well really you know um, and I suppose look at you know obviously like you're not you're not um, in the business of trying to sell this guy at the moment but like if we were to look at him and his ilk and maybe take it back a couple of years you know like what is the what is the demand out there like for ponies of this stature like is it you know, is it is it um is it is it lucrative potentially to have this nature of a of a pony? Um, absolutely, yeah. So for him, his his market would be for a competitive career, and um, that that is that is his life. Like that's what he loves, and um, and it would be like he could he could potentially do anything. Like he would he would be of a standard to go show jumping, and he'd still love it. You know, he 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 could event. He loves his cross country. He'd have good good level of flat work that he could do dressage. So he would be, if you had a young version of him, and um, that would be the market would be entirely competitive and like that. He could go in any direction because he was he is so talented in all disciplines, mm-hmm. and has that drive to please. And like Alicia, do you think? In your experience or in your from your perspective, is it easy to find replacement Freds out there? Is it easy to find this nature of pony out there? Is that is that a is um that... yes, I, I like I've been lucky all the way through that I've had some really, really great ponies to compete. And the Connemaras do once you form a great relationship with them they want to please and and their aim is to kind of give you that dig out help you out and and do what they can to help you and in terms of a replacement for fred i don't think i'll ever find a replacement for fred he's just he is a genuine all-round all-round competition pony and like even on his bad days he's fantastic and so in terms of finding a replacement for him, I don't know if I ever will. And um, he is the all round package, but there is definitely I have definitely had ponies who have gone and and won Dublin and have you know 
um, had similar achievements to him, but just not to the consistency um, as him and the longevity of him. Because, like, I don't what, know of a point. What age was has. he here? What age was he here in Hoyes? He was 20, yeah, he was 24 when he won in Hoyes. And yeah. um, so that was two years ago. Um, and, like, the judge, the judge at the time when, when she was doing confirmation, she actually couldn't believe how old he was and that he had also travelled from Ireland the day before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, she, she was a bit shocked at that. So just for, um, anyone, but it's not, for anyone who maybe doesn't know, what did he achieve here? What How special was this? Um, so he won the first ever qualifier in Ireland for the Mountain and Moorland Working Hunter um, of the Year Championship in a Horse of the Year show. He so we went over, we traveled over then to Hoys, and um, we were lucky enough to win the class. It's it's a it's a huge prestigious show, and in that particular year, we actually had two or three previous winners in it, um, and multiple winners in it. So it was a really really tough um competition that year, and yeah, it was just I words can't describe how amazing it was. It was an unbelievable experience. Um. Yeah, and he he loved every second of it. <laughs> and you did too, I'm sure, as well. He called by obviously, and yes, absolutely, sure. yes. So probably ner- nerves and that in the, in play as well too. But yeah, and like I suppose you know, um, what were the like what were the demands of of qualifying for this? Like what what was what are the heights? What is what was he? What did he have to do? Um, yeah, so the the qualifier um, reflects the the final. They jump a course of working hunter fences, fences, um, rustic natural type fences. You can kind of see some of them there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the height dimension is a meter five. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's for ponies that are over fourteen hands. So most of the ponies in this class would be Connemara's, but there are a few other native breeds, um, such as Welsh ponies. A Welsh pony won it this year, um, and so it is open to all mountain and moorland breeds, mm-hmm. but it is based on a height. So they have different height categories, and he's the biggest height category. Mm-hmm. Very good. So we're gonna we're gonna move on and look at another one of yours, um, and that's Grey Smoke, and this this was um born in two thousand and eight. So do you happen to yeah. know the height he he measured at, or do you remember? Um, he measured at fifteen hands. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Um, so he and how how like at what stage did you start working with him, or how old was he, or tell us a little bit about about that sort of end of it. Um. Yeah. So he he Henry. That this was Henry. And um, so Henry came to us. Um. When he was six. So he was only broken when he was six. Mm-hmm. Um. Up to that point, he was pretty much untouched Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of work obviously to be done there to get him up um, and competing so by the end of his six-year-old year year, we had him out to a few shows um, and then he went for a break and came back in um, and we would have then done a lot of work in terms of getting experience under his belt because because he was seven he was he was kind of he was finishing up in the younger category for the performance class so a lot of the ponies that he would have been competing against who were also seven would have had an awful lot more mileage um, than he would have but again he had a fantastic attitude of just wanting to please mm-hmm. um, he was a bit different to Fred in the sense that starting off he wasn't a natural in the ring he found it quite like overwhelming mm-hmm. partly because he was so used to not seeing people for the first six years of his life um, but he then, because of his just willingness to please and, and that, that drive to just compete and, and give it his all, he actually completely turned around and turned into an absolute superstar in terms of jumping. Um, he did, he obviously because he was a little bit bigger, he didn't do quite as well in the ridden classes, but he still you know, he's still really good flat work, performed really well. 
and uh, last, and last he, a run of um I can let this run yeah the while you're talking there yeah um so I can't what well, yeah 2018 he won the um performance hunter yeah. in Dublin um he actually he won it I think if I remember correctly he actually had a fence in hand and so he could have actually had a pole down um, and still won it because his flat work score was so high mm -hmm. um, and his his flat and his um, way of going score so how he went around the course mm -hmm. um, but and he was he was similar to Fred in that he, he has that really kind of big powerful athletic stride um, which I think really suits those classes and um did he come to you with a view to he was sold since did he come to you with a view to being produced to sell or was that um he different? came he initially came to me with a view to be produced for dublin um well in the hope that he could be produced for dublin mm. obviously that worked out very well um and when he won then it was kind of um and then covid came along and it was decided you know what it'd be really nice to you know get him a new home where he can go and keep someone else happy so that's mm -hmm. a couple of pictures of him there in his his new home and a little um video so this is the little girl at the bottom and like that you know like he is a big powerful pony but you can see there like she's absolutely tiny on him and in his ride ability like it, it just transfers straight across like she can sit up on him mm -hmm. and I'm sure he can barely even feel her up there um but he just he's just wants to please um and he's just a great ride ability and attitude to mm -hmm. to life so, and he left the country didn't he yeah so he went to Holland yeah and I suppose just in terms of like marketing him and that was he was he sold from the gate at home or did you use you know social media or how did that how, how what was the mechanism of actually finding a, a buyer for for him or how did that come about if you don't mind me asking um, that. that was that was actually I I had previously sold um a draft horse out to Holland um and it was the same kind of um group of people that were looking for they were from the same yard and um, so they were looking for a pony um, and I'd often get like a text been like, do, I, <laughs> do you know of X, Y and Z? Um, and at the time they were looking for um, a pony, a Connemara, ideally a Connemara pony um, for a young girl to um, compete. And um, so I sent on a few pictures and videos of him and obviously they fell in love and the rest is history. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Now, look, we're not going to get into talking about sales prices or that this evening, but there is a query along the lines of, you know, he was class three. And did you feel that that affected his his um sales price in any way? Um, So as a gelding at the time, they didn't classify geldings mm -hmm. um, and he he was never actually classified. And um, so that is why he's class three Um, in his book. He was down as um he was still down as a cult. So that's why it was marked as class three. But at the time, they didn't classify geldings. Now I know that is that had previously they used to classify geldings, and um, and I think they're going back to it now, in, in that they have to be measured to get their their classification status. Um, but as a gelding, it doesn't re it didn't really make a huge difference. Um, in that sense, especially if they're not going down the showing route. And before we leave the kind of classification sort of bit of it, I mean, you know, does does classification of these connies or drafts bear much relevance to you as a producer um, with the mind of producing for here for the home market or with the mind of producing to maybe, um, you know, sell on to the UK or wherever? Like, is that an important uh, consideration in any way? Um. Yes, it can, it can be important in terms of, um there are certain classes and, and certain categories um both with drafts and Connemara's in that they have to have um parents from a class one or class two um background. So it like it depends on obviously what you're looking for with the animal, but if you're not really sure um 
obviously if they do have um class if they are classified and if they do have class one or class two parents it opens more doors for you so for the drafts like for them to compete in England as a draft in draft shows they have to have class one or class two parents and um, so without that yes you can still sell to England but you are making your market smaller and mm-hmm. um, in you know it, it makes it a little bit more difficult but it depends what way you're marketing the, the animal to and what what you're what you're producing if you're producing an all-rounder that can go on and do everything you know it, it's not a huge issue but if you are specifically producing for um showing classes and native showing classes it is definitely a consideration when you are breeding mm-hmm. or buying there's another question in here um from somebody along the lines of you know that people love in the, in their experience people love an oversized conmar pony um do you do you and this question can go to neve as well too um do you guys think that people should be looking to breed more of these bigger animals um and maybe that's a, a fair unfair question yes to ask. yes <laughs> it, it it's a tough question um, it's a tough question yeah there there is an awful lot of overhyped ponies now um, and there is, without doubt, a brilliant market for them because an oversized Connemara is now the family pony because the drafts have actually have actually gone nearly too big to be the family horse, yeah. and the oversized Connemara is kind of taking over that market. Um, I think, I think it would be a real shame to lose the smaller pony. Um, so I I can I can see both sides of the argument. In terms of, you know, if if they are overhyped, obviously they're not really a pony anymore, but there is a huge market and demand for them. So as a breeder, I mean, you could probably come in on that. It's probably, you know, more beneficial to you to have that overhyped pony in terms of selling on um, as an all rounder. But then you also as a breeder and a traditional, well, I, I think as a traditional breeder, you don't want to lose what is the Connemara pony either. Yes, I, I think that it you have to decide yourself as a breeder what it is that you're going to breed because you have a responsibility to breed something that can be used in the future. And I say used, I mean enjoyed and has a purpose and has a loving home and a kind home. And the overhead Connemara is, yeah, they have a great market and they're there as riding horses and leisure horses, oftentimes probably more for adults nearly than children but there's space there's room for everybody that's the way I'd look at it but you as a breeder I think everyone as a breeder has to decide am I breeding something that somebody else can enjoy in the future and will have a loving home I think that's the most important question that any breeder should ask themselves going forwards like what are they breeding for and that that animal will have a home going forward like look at Freddie, there he is still going strong at 26 and in a loving home all his life. What and, more could you wish for? No for chance any of let go. <laughs> no chance mm-hmm. of being let go. Um, I, I just Absolutely want to then to you, uh, Alicia, in terms of, I suppose, the Conmar Pony, the opportunities for, I suppose, the competitive opportunities as you see them. Like, are there, is there anything that you'd like to see change or improved or? you know other other or different opportunities are you do you do you feel like the direction that things have gone in the last number of years with the performance class and that do they do they act as a good showcase as a good marketing tool or are there there tweaks that you'd love to see happen from your perspective as a as a producer um i think what we have here in ireland is very good in terms of a marketing tool and um, for the ponies in the sense like the Connemara performance class in Dublin and the high performance class in Clifton, they are all great tools to use to produce a pony to a really good standard, especially now it has gone. And this, again, it depends on your perspective and um, that you are coming into the, the performance class, particularly in Dublin. It has gone super competitive mm-hmm. to the point where it's nearly pro- it is nearly professional. Um, and in some ways that is really great in terms of we are producing ponies to a really really high standard 
and it is continually improving um, the standard of riding and the standard of production of the pony. But on the other hand, um, as Neve said, if you actually look at these Connemara classes, performance classes, the majority of people producing and riding the ponies in the classes are actually adults, um, mm. which, again, is a shame because the pony is is an all round pony. It's the family pony. Um, now this year there was um like you do. It's not that you don't see children riding them, but it is very very difficult, obviously, for a fourteen or fifteen year old child to Please. produce a pony. Back. Yeah. To, to compete and, and compete on par with the likes of me for example who has been doing it for the last 10-15 years I'm doing the Connemara performance class every year yeah. at least in the qualifiers I know the, do you know, like, I know the system I know what they're looking for for, for a 14 or 15 year old to come along and try compete against that it is very difficult not impossible but it does make it um, a lot more difficult but again, the standard of production has really, really increased. And the standard of riding has also been brought up as which well. All, all you can see that in the classes. Which is a positive. It is all positive, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. Just, just my last question too, before we, we move over on to some of the Nara Valley um, um, animals. Um, is, it, is it, I suppose, like from a, from a perspective of selling these ponies you know and this is a, a prime example of one that you produced and and was sold on like do you feel it is important to get that showing mileage on them here and to not just get the showing mileage but to be bringing the accolades home with them like how much of a factor has that got to play when it comes to to um you know finding that that more lucrative new home shall we say oh yeah yeah, it de- it definitely is a factor. Um, you know, obviously, like if you have have a pony that has a win in Dublin or you know has all these achievements listed, that is obviously going to to give you a better market. But I really think the main thing is is the production of them. Um, and again, the classes are actually giving you the opportunity to to produce animals to this high standard that have good flat work, that have the right ability, you know, that especially the the Dublin performance class, you know, they have to be, you know, careful jumpers because they're all knockables. Any of the working hunter classes, they have they have to be careful jumpers because most of them are knockables. But the Dublin class also adds in the the element of cross country. So if you have a pony that has qualified and competed in the RDS, you have a pony that has a high standard of flat work you have a pony that is careful jumper you have a brave jumper because they've been like they have to be brave to go cross country so it's giving you a market that it it opens up a lot of doors because they have such a a diverse background and a strong background in all three kind of areas yeah it's really important just like to pop in where alicia was speaking there like dublin like the performance hunter class really revolutionized Connemara's at Dublin now I see I've been competing in Dublin when there was in-hand classes I don't think many people remember that there were actually in-hand Connemara classes at Dublin and unfortunately they faded out because they weren't supported I remember being there one day and there was two of us in the ring it was a four and five year old mayor class and there was two of us and there were six entries but two of us turned up so naturally the the classes just disappeared and then they brought in the performance hunter and that's gone from strength to strength. But they've also uh, reimagined, not reimagined, but they, with the flat classes, there were so many people there. I remember being there with Ashinar Valley Hope and there was 30 in the ring and they had to do something and they did. They brought in qualifiers, just like you have the qualifiers for the performance hunter. They brought in the qualifiers for Dublin as well. And the standard of polling, the standard of riding has it didn't rise, but it, before you could just, it was the fastest finger on the button, whoever entered fastest was in. Whereas now you have to qualify, so you get there on merit. So Dublin have done a lot to ensure that the standards nice. increased. And that has filtered out throughout the country then because people are qualifying to get to Dublin and they're going to other shows. So the whole standard of riding and produ- producing of Connemara's has risen. 
and like Dublin now, it's like Hoys or like Olympia or like the RIHS, you have to qualify to get there. And it's really important to people to be there. Yeah. So, and it does make a difference when you're going to sell, definitely. So turning to your own breeding program now, Neve, um, yes. I suppose this lady is, as we've turned it here on the slide, your foundation mayor. And yeah, tell us tell us about her and tell tell us how how you came to have her if you remember that and I suppose just a little bit about what her what her traits were as you remember them and what her positives as you remember them were. Oh, she's just lovely. She just she had a fabulous <laughs> temperament. She's just gorgeous. Now I remember the first day I saw her. My parents had uh, they went off. They found her actually, and they met Corey Coins. I don't know exactly how, but they did. And he's canal stage and he's been breeding Connemara ponies for years. And he's the dam at that mare actually was uh, a winner at Dublin, possibly even champion Connemara. I can't remember, but definitely a winner. Her name was Village Laura. And this is her first fall. And I remember going to see her. They found her. My parents had found her in Connemara. And uh, I remember seeing her on a very wet, windy November day. And it was out past the railway lines, the old railway lines, and oh, it was bleak. And I thought she looked lovely. Now, she was snow white even then. So you can imagine snow white pony on a wet day, you know, and she looked lovely that day. But she's been a great mare and we didn't show her an awful lot in hand. When we were starting, we hadn't, I never, I suppose, to give people courage who might be starting off or who haven't done an awful lot of showing themselves. I never showed anything in hand until this mare arrived along and uh, we went to Clifton and we came seventh the first time and then we went with the foal and I don't know which foal this is because it took a lot of searching to find that photo mm. and uh, we went with the foal and the foal was exhausted after the journey we said we'd never bring a foal again so because she was having foals we didn't actually compete her again but we had backed her and I had ridden her at home and we did a lot of hacking out. We'd lovely wood. We have a lot of woodlands. Well, we used to. Have, the woodlands are still there, but of course they put in a lot of broken stone on the tracks mm -hmm. to get the timber out, so they've ruined the paths. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we really enjoyed her, and she was a fantastic mare and a lovely temperament. And her mare was her dam was a winner, and her sire then was Cucullin. Now Cucullin was an international, and I'm I'm open to correction here. We think he was an international show jumping pony at European level. Uh, it was either show jumping or venting. We think it was show jumping, but we're, we can't remember exactly. But uh, yeah, so we got a sort of a, an athletic pony. So we were delighted with her and she just had a lovely temperament. So easy, you could always put her in the box, bring her in or out. It was always very easy. So she's just lovely. So between 1993 and 2003, she had nine foals and five of those are fillies and four geldings. And some of these now we'll refer back to later in later slides again. But I suppose in relation to, um, you know, like what was important to you over the years um, as a family in choosing the, the stallions to, to cross with her? And some of them, like, as you can see, just highlighted different colours there that were used twice with the mare, you know, different years. Yeah. And there's some like commonality in the back breeding of some of the stallions as well, too. What were the key, like what in, in essence, if you can kind of sort of crunch it down into a, a short description, like what were you looking for in stallions to match with her? Uh, I suppose a stallion that would complement her and bring out her um, strongest attributes because she was by Cucullin, she performance pedigree there. So Abby Leakes Fionn, the first gelding, and he's the picture of him is up on the top right hand corner jumping. That's uh, Narvali Oscar. He's by Abby Leakes Fionn, and Abby Leakes Fionn was also, we think he definitely was at European level, and we think he was a um, top level eventing pony. But he died early, and I think it was due to, it was due, equine influenza took an awful lot of hor horses and ponies back in the night early 90s night mid 90s and uh, he was one unfortunately mm -hmm. that was lost to the breed and uh then but we got a lot of advice like not only did we source our first mare from Pori Kynes but he was very helpful he helped us to he'd give us a kind of a few recommendations of stallions that he think would be complementary 
to our mayor and then we'd look at them in turn and then we'd select them. So like Abbey Leaks, Fionn, Grange, Bobbing, Sparrow, they definitely were recommended by Pork and they were gorgeous. And the actual, this, um, if you go down as far as 1999 with Lock for the Millie by Grange, Bobbing, Sparrow, she's a full sister. Then the first one was sold to Italy as a jumping pony, but then Lock for the Midi, Millie, Fortune was sold here to Ireland, the Lockfather stud Porig and Nicola Heaney there in Clifton. And they came, uh, they were reserve junior champion in no, in 2002 with Lockfather Millie. So that kind of gave us great encouragement to keep going with the breeding. And then Ashfield Miller, even though both those geldings are over a height, the, po- the stallion wasn't over height, the mare wasn't over height, but they came over height. And we knocked great fun out of them. I had one. I kept Miller and the other fella then, Ashfield, he went to England and he was a general leisure horse by a lady uh, who was come trekking with us years ago, Gillian Bottom, and she had a lifetime of enjoyment with him. And then one stallion that I picked out myself was Audrey Conga because I was looking for, because I used to go to seminars, you know, when you're starting off, you don't know a whole pile and I needed to learn about what it is that they were looking for in ponies. And a lot of the seminars were focusing on breed type and bone. We used to be hearing about bone, bone, that the the ponies are lacking bone and lacking type. And then there was Audrey Kunga, who was in Clifton. And I just thought he was gorgeous. He was a done pony. And he is the sire of the second pony there, who is Audrey Nahira, the only pony I ever gave an Irish name to because no one could pronounce it afterwards. So I said never again, because like you were asking about the market with Alicia, most of the ponies that we breed here go, well, definitely back in the 90s and the noughties, they were going abroad. They weren't staying here in Ireland. They were usually going abroad. The majority were. So I said, gosh, if they're going to, and they predominantly go to English, so they must have names that people can pronounce. So uh, that she was the one and only Irish named horse we ever had and pony, I should say, we ever had. And I absolutely adored her. And she was always in the, she was either fourth, usually fourth, fifth, if I brought her to Clifton, she was fourth, fifth or sixth in hand. That's where she came. And she was just gorgeous. And she was champion at Colosti Pony Show in 2000. That's the photo of her. And then she was reserve champion. She was just a super mayor. And then below her then is Nara Valley Leah. Who was by Monaghan's town, Fred. And you're introducing Westside Fred there more. And I hope that like what we were trying to do is breed ponies that you'd look at them and say, yeah, Connemara pony. And that they would have bone as well. That the attributes that are set out in the breed books were what we were presenting. And the bottom one then is Nara Valley Lo- Lauren. Oh. Now, she's by a son of Abbey Leaks Fionn. So we're connecting back. So we're connecting back with Abbey Leaks Fionn. And because and she's by Monaghan's town Fionn. And um, she was one of the mares that we kept on. And we'll afterwards. come back to talk about her as well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So just then, I suppose, um, Nara Valley Oscar, maybe tell us a little bit about him and, um, you know, what his what his accolades were. Yeah, I alluded to him earlier. Yeah, he was he went to Clifton once and once only as a foal. And um, he we put him under saddle and he was jumped very successfully by uh, down the bottom left. So we had him backed and riding. And this goes back to the canal stud and he's by Abbey Leaks Fionn there with Sean Don had him standing here in Ireland and the photo stand at the bottom the bottom left is where he won a jumping competition but we knew he was into jumping anyway because we had him out hunting one day and uh, I remember Anne McCarthy who has been with us in the trekking centre for years and has been a wonderful help over many decades minding ponies and we'd have to go and it'd be there and she'd look after him we're very grateful and thanks and uh, she was riding him and everyone else were slithering down a bank. Everyone was slithering down a bank. And what does Oscar do? Only launch himself off the top of a five foot bank down. So Anne stayed on anyway. We knew then we had a fellow who could jump. And Horrick Hines and somebody was over from 
the Otto Earlies were over from Germany and they were looking for a Connemara pony for their daughters. They and they bought they had they came down to us because we had what they were looking for, which was a gelding who was riding. And they came down and they bought him. So he went over to Germany and they had another Connemara called Trigger. And the two of them competed with their daughters to in, uh, European international level. And they were in the top 10 of eventing ponies in Germany at that time. And the two and what was lovely is that the Otto Earlies had a riding school uh, specializing in riding for the disabled and Oscar and Trigger saw out their lives there and they were used in the riding school subsequent to their eventing career. So they had a long they had long lives in Germany. And it gave us great encouragement that we were kind of on the right way. Now, here's the stallion I was telling you about. This is Audrey Nahira. And up in the top left is the foundation mare. And below her then is Audrey Kunga. This is the Don stallion. He was owned by Sean Luskin. And he only stood, in, he wasn't standing in Ireland for an awful long time. But um, he was sold on, I can't remember, was it, I think it was Finland. It was either Finland or Sweden. And I'm nearly certain Finland. So it was Finland's gain and our loss because we got this lovely pony because I would have brought the mare back again but couldn't because he was gone and we bred Audrey in Naira and she just was a fab mare. I did a lot of showing in hand. I did a lot of showing in hand in the, well, some in the 90s and then a good bit in the noughties and my sister was helping me at all the shows. She was like, she was groom number one. So she was helping all those days I was out. She was there helping me and it culminated her best day. Then we had qualified, you know, for the um, broodmare championship at the Midlands. Mm -hmm. So we went and we took part in that anyway. And then you could take part in the mayor class afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I think we were placed, we were kind of fifth or sixth in the broodmare championship class. So we're eligible for our mayor class. So in we went and we went on to be reserve champion at the Midlands show. So that was really lovely because that book ended her career, really. They were her two probably biggest days, but I mean, she was fantastic in Clifton and there was many happy times at Clifton when we'd go out to Omi Island, I usually the day after the show on the Friday and we'd hack out on the beach and ride on the beach before we'd load up and head for home. So many, many happy years with this mare and she was just a wonderful brood mare. And we'll come back in a, in a little while and talk about the progeny of her as well. Um, and Thank so you. this then is the eighth foal of Canal Lauren. So um, Nair Valley, Nair Valley Lauren. Yes, um, she is by Monaghan's town Fionn, down at the bottom, who's the son of Abbey League's Fionn. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to say, like, over all the years, like we've been three decades, I just want to thank all the stallion owners that we've met and been friends with and helped us out at different times in different ways over all the years and got to know so many people across the country as well with it. So we bred Nair Valley Lauren. Now this um and this is another mare that we kept. So ordering Nahira and Nair Valley Lauren, we kept them on. And these photos are from 2005 at Clifton. And I just brought her as a three-year-old. I didn't bring her back again because we put her riding and I just mentioned there, I want to say a special thank you to photojob.com and Susan Lehman and Jorgen, without whom I'd say we probably would have no photos <laughs> because we're not people, we weren't, I was never good for taking photos and without her really, I'd say we'd have nothing. So Susan, Jorgen, thanks a million. Yeah. So should we just, we had this lady, so she was third in Clifton. The one and only time I brought her I said, you know, it'll never get better than this now. And we were delighted and then we had her backed and riding and we produced her under saddle. Well, we didn't call again equestrian centre. I used to tack her out, but she, you had been, we'd been talking about black type. This mare is actually a, a grade C show jumping mare. Mm -hmm. I, went, I know she has the points. I just couldn't find them online. And it was actually Peter Maloney of uh, Colligan Equestrian Centre and Louise Maloney and family. They used to ride her and she was just every time she went out it was a double clear she was brilliant mm -hmm. and you know, people are saying about temperament oh 
just so soft and gentle. She'd always work with you. And whether she was hacking out or she was jumping, she was always trying her best and she never put a foot wrong with me. So I was delighted with her. And Niamh, when you look at like, you know, the, the, the variety of the progeny that you had from Canal Lauren, like, do you think there were commonality in the traits across the progeny? Um, how much of an influence do you think the Stallions had over and above what Canal Lauren herself brought to the table and put through the family? Um, I suppose you, the way I look at it is that your Stallion is to compliment your mare and improve her. So you look at your mare and say, right, what's good about her? And then you marry her with a stallion that you think will add in where she might be slightly lacking. So not lacking or you want more like I would. She's a fabulous temperament. So we never had we, all the family have had such easygoing temperaments and they'd always work with you. But I suppose the one thing I used to always look out for with uh, Canal Lauren was just look for ponies with bone so that we'd be adding that little bit more bone there that you just make it that bit stronger so that their conformation would be stronger and that their bones would hold up. It's like you look at Fred from Alicia and look at the conformation, look at the bone. He's still there at 26. He was competing this year. That's because he's got bone and strength and conformation and was well looked after. So there's a, there's a question in here from somebody earlier on, you know, in terms of what's the most important thing to look out for when Buying a potential broodmare as a three year old, you know, what what would you feel are, are the 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 advice to give somebody at that at that point? Um, I would. Well, it, yeah, it is, it is. I would be looking for one that has I look at it and say, yeah, Connemara pony. Uh, secondly, that it's correct, is that it's straight as in that one foot is following the other, that it's straight. It's not weaving or it's not crooked. Because it's very difficult to breed out crookedness, um, temperament, that it has got a good um, upbringing. It's nice to know where the animal is coming from, that it has got a good start in life, that's been cared for and minded and has been wormed and has had its feet done and make sure that has, has been seen by a farrier regularly to make sure that the hooves are in good condition and round and you know, no hoof, no horse. And I just pop in thanks, Raymond Barrister, all over all the years he looked after. All the thanks in tonight, I have to get all the thanks in tonight. There's three decades worth of thanks. Okay. They're going to be well, I'm, I'm watching go. the hour clock here as well, too. So we better have motoring, all right? But uh, when you're mo yeah, so that it looks if I was buying a Connemara, it looks like a Connemara, it's going to do what it wants. Has it got bone? I think the bottom photo of Narrow Valley Lauren there is a nice photo. Unfortunately, our two ears aren't prick forward, but, you know, other than that, she's a nice, um, I like, so there are three parts, you know, that they're all in equal measure and that they have a strong hind quarters because that's the engine to propel them forwards. Okay, so we're going to come back in a little while. I'm going to look at some of the, some of the progeny of those mares. Um, just while I'm moving on now to um to the drafts with Alicia, um kind of before we go there, there's somebody else that asked a question like if you breed a foal that you anticipate, and I presume we're talking here ponies now, um that won't go over height, and you decide to to and can, uh, if you breed a foal that will not go over height and can keep it, which is the better market? And I kind of putting this to you, Alicia, before we go in into the drafts, is it? The, the the three year old unbroken or is it the four year old and older that's broken and done a bit in your opinion? Um, I think people do generally like to have a pony that has done a bit. Personally, when I am looking for a pony, I prefer a three year old that hasn't done anything, mm -hmm. purely because I like to put my own stamp on them and I I like producing them myself, but. In general, the market is looking for a pony that has done a bit, has a bit of mileage. You know, they, generally speaking, a lot a lot of people aren't confident in doing that, especially, you know, for your general all-rounder or for your, your, your um, child pony. A lot of people aren't confident in, in bringing on a young pony. So they do like to have, you know, I suppose the firsts ticked off in the sense that, you know, they're ridden. They've been to a few shows. Maybe they they might have hunted. You know, they they've jumped at a course fences, and um, so I do think 
I think that is a benefit when you are selling. But I suppose you have to weigh up the options of, you know, the time and the money you want to spend. If you're if you're doing it as a breeder, do you want to put in that time and money to bring them to that five, four or five year old stage? Or would you just rather bring them to a three year old and, you know, have someone else then produce them on? Mm. Um, it's, and again, it goes back to what Neve was saying. is You have to decide as a breeder what, what you're aiming for with your pony or with the ponies that you're breeding. Absolutely. So turning to the drafts then and the other love in your life. <laughs> um yes tell us a little bit about this 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 and we're referring on this slide here to the fold so this is daddy and mommy and um Gartan dancer is is the animal that we're talking about so um you know like did you know the mother um i actually didn't so this horse sean is his name um so he would have been my second draft i had a really really good draft before that um uh, getting flag bound but Sean came to me to we, basically to be produced for sales in, in Cavan. So he spent a couple of weeks with us, basically, you know, a bit of handling, a bit of loose jumping, producing him for the um, the sale and doing kind of sales video and, and a couple of photos. And um, he did go to Cavan. Mm -hmm. They didn't get what they wanted for him. I had somewhat fallen in love with him by then. And um, I loved his attitude. I thought he had a fantastic head and in terms of a, a, a quality of, as a quality draft it's it, I, th I thought it was very hard to get something of his quality and he was sitting in my yard and I went I'm kind of looking for a draft anyway so I said you know what I'll make an offer on him and <laughs> so luckily I, I got him <laughs> and he, he's fantastic breeding so you know Gork Free Hero obviously is well known um, and he's well known he's gone to a very high level um, show jumping here in Ireland and then obviously his mother is by Crosstown Dancer so um, who is legendary um, so he is fantastic performance breeding um, so left is the first photo there on the top left is actually the, the week we backed him so you can see a poor little scrawny three year old there and um, it would have been in the October of his three year old year and the the photo then following that would have been a few four or five weeks later and then so the four-year-old pictures would have been Dublin and Balmoral he would well he was um at the time in Balmoral there was actually only one ridden draft class so he was in against the older horses and there it was a huge class it was one of the early draft classes so there was over 20 in it he went around he behaved himself he got lost in the crowd in the initial go around and was pulled like way, way down. He was pulled in 20th and he actually came up 18 places wow. after the ride that he gave the judge. And so like he's, he's, he's a bus of a ride, big, strong horse, huge front on him. Mm -hmm. um, but like that light and mannerly and balanced. And um, so he then went on, He's been one of those horses that he's like, he, he's really, really talented, but I, I'm still waiting for that really big win for him. Um, but I know, I know it's in him somewhere. <laughs> he, he, he's a super jumper. And like that, you can see in his breeding, you know, look, if he, if he didn't jump, I mean, you may throw the, everything about breeding out the window because, you know, it all comes through. You can see it through his lines. Like they're, they're all jumpers. Um, and you can see there like he he has scope to burn like he is a big draft he's he's 72 and he's like he's a strong type draft he's not one of these light boned more athletic types he is he has the traditional bone he's carrying a lot of bone but yet he still has that athleticism Um, like they're the photos they're kind of top right there of him in Hoy's in the horse of the year show this year where it, it's a working hunter track and it's it's a meter 20 working hunter track um, and it takes obviously a lot of jumping um, whereas here like here we don't actually get working hunter tracks to that height it's usually about a meter 10 that we get so he had a, he's a lot of experience to a meter 10 but the meter 20 is you know a step up for him but 
like the scope he it's well within his scope and as you can see in the photos there he's he's well able to to pop over them he's it makes it easy looking so like my question then i guess is like is he an amateur ride you know like has he the potential um, to that market or not yeah absolutely like he he's the horse like i i hunt him you can see there on left hand side like I, i've done that kildare um hunter performance show on him so like he'll hunt he he jumps ditches he jumps hedges and um, he is a bigger horse so he is he is a big draft and um, i suppose that probably can put people off and um, in, in some sense um but anyone who knows me and um, knows i am tiny i'm only about five one so you know size can put put a lot of people off especially now with the, the bigger drafts and and drafts that are showing especially th- and even ch- show horses they do tend to be big um, and it can put a lot of people off but drafts are are like the conmares they have a great attitude you know they're sensible they, they have the same attributes as the conmares just in the horse yeah. version when you like i suppose when you compare say this fella to and I'm going to put it like a younger comparable age version of Fred, right? Um, <laughs> that, that's not a fair comparison. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to balance it out from the perspective of obviously, you know, to, to pitch to pitch Fred to the market now at this age, right? I'm just saying yeah. that that talent, that, you know, that package and this package in the draft, which do you think has the 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 wider market potential and the the higher value potential possibilities is that fair so, um that that's a very it's a very hard comparison and um, like the the draft has a larger market in terms of you know they can be the huntsman's horse mm-hmm. you know that they 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 can be the adult horse, and I know a lot of Connemaras can be the adult horse, especially the old, old the over height ones. Um, but like a big draft, you know, you're, you're standing on top of a big ditch <laughs> for hunting. A big draft is is very useful to be sitting on, and um, especially and um, coming down to big hedges. So it is a different market in the sense that I think it's for drafts. I think it is actually more of an an amateur mm-hmm. animal in the sense that. Um, people who have them have them that they, they want a sensible horse that can kind of do a little bit of everything you know they can turn their hoof to everything they can hunt they can jump they can do dressage and um, whereas the Connemara I think has become more competitive partly because it was a competitive child's pony um, and also now the marketing of the the Connemara performance class which there is now a mirror of that for the draft is the same kind of format but if you actually stand and watch the two classes, either in qualifiers or um, or in the RDS, you can see how the Connemara has developed. The, the class has developed a more professional route, whereas the drafts there's still a lot of amateurs producing them, and that is great to see. And I think the Connemara is kind of it would be nice to be able to see the Connemara's having something yeah. uh, that there is a little bit of a mix, mm-hmm. but you can see that the drafts are a few years behind the Connemara's in that performance class. Um, and it's, it is nice to see like, the, you can see the drafts just go out and go, yeah, let's go do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they give a lot of amateur and home produced riders an awful lot of um, fun and entertainment uh, for competing because, they're, e- they're, like, they're easy to do again they have a great attitude and they just go out and do the job and want to please and mm-hmm. um, this is another one of, <laughs> yeah another so this one is of your pleasers yeah <laughs> this is another one of my pleasers this is my um he's currently six um i that this was my covid project and um, so when covid lockdown was i did yeah yeah, so COVID lockdown came in and I kind of decided I needed a project for the summer while we were locked down and n- not competing. So I went, well, at the time, um, the market went crazy um, and you couldn't get a horse anywhere. And, and anything you got was was crazy prices for, for animals that had done 
nothing and like that people weren't even going to see them they were just buying them through Facebook or through online and they didn't even go and have a look at the horse they just paid a deposit and it was gone um, but I was lucky to find this fella in a field down near Athlone. Um, and at the time, you know, he he was actually quite small at the time. He was only about 16 hands, 16 one. Um, and he was to be a project for me. Um, so a couple of years later, I still have him. Um, but he, again, he's just, he's been such a lovely horse to work with Um. He, he, what, he's, height, what height is he, Keisha? He, he's 17'2 now as well, and um, he grew. <laughs> okay. um, he grew a lot. Um, and again, size can put, I suppose, prospective buyers off in, in that sense, which is a shame because he, like, as a horse, he is your pure, you know, amateur's horse to go out and do everything on. So to have, like, basically to love you, give you a cuddle he's I always say he's he's a seven he's an, an 11 two pony girls princess pony trapped in a draft um body um like he would be happy to be a child pony um <laughs> in the sense that he is he is so good he loves people he just wants to give everything a go for you um, just bring, just bring the but, ladder yeah. to get but, up on <laughs> just just yeah exactly just bring the ladder to get to climb up onto him <laughs> um but yeah, he he is one that I would say is like the the definition of like your home produced amateur horse that would just go out and give you fun days all the time because he just goes out with a big smile on his face and goes, yeah, what are we doing today? So when you compare him and um Gartown, like what do you see as the differences between them? Are they very similar, or there are there clear differences between them for you? Um. Yeah, they are they are quite similar um in many respects. Um but Sean or Gortain Dancer, I, I do think he has more scope um whereas Louis, this guy, um he's more of an all rounder type. Like like Sean is, is jumper. You know, he has the power for the jumping. And I'm not saying that Louis doesn't have the power, but Again, he's more of an all rounder, whereas Sean, you could turn around and you could go sh- like you could go show jumping to a, a high level with him, and um, if you wanted to. Whereas I think Louis would be more of a working hunter and an all rounder performance type. So, which of them do you feel is easier to find out there? You know, as in that there are more to find of- a market. Mm-hmm. Or which which is easier to find? Um, which is easier to find in the draft, and which is easier to find a market for of the two? And um, it's very. I think it's it's quite hard now to find um those really athletic jumpers in draft. Um. That that you know obviously drafts are are known for their performance, but I find that to compete in the in the bigger classes and, and the way show jumping is going now it's very difficult to get a draft that can that can match up to the blood horses mm-hmm. um now i do think i uh, sean the gortown dancer definitely has that scope and ability i think it's it's hard to find that now in the draft Um. again a lot of drafts have gone big um, and and the ones that have kept the bone and kept the heaviness They've nearly gone too big and heavy, and um, like Louis, this King Silver here, and um, he is a big horse, and he's he's an awful lot more bone than Sean would have, and um, when you when you actually stand them um together, but he actually Louis is actually a really light mover for the mm-hmm. size of him, and um, so he he would have a lot of scope, but he doesn't give you that explosive jump that Gortown Dancer would or Sean. Um, so that's much safer again, feeling it, it, then for an amateur. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll move on now to um back to your tale, Neve, and pick yeah. it up with the progeny of Ardreen and Naira. Are you impressed with my pronunciation? I practiced. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. 
<laughs> yeah, it's quite a mouthful. It's it's tripping up everybody. Yeah, she, it, it translates. It means High Queen of the Nair. Okay, so she so had nine go. foals. So there were six fillies and three colts in it. And we'll come back again to talk about hope and harmony. But if you want to give us a little bit of an insight into Heather and Hannah here. Yes, the photo of Heather is up there on the top right hand corner. And that's actually from Germany. She was sold as a three-year-old, and she's actually Susan Lehman who bought it. That's how we got to know Susan Lehman. And uh, she bought Heather. And I think, I hope, I think Susan's had many happy years with her. And she crossed her with um, Hazy Match. And that progeny, that filly, the Eckley prefix is used. And uh, she went on to be champion pony in Germany. She's actually had three generations who has that and Heather has been involved in two of them. So Frederick's Vintage match was champion. This is at the overall breed show. So 16 breeds turn up there and it was the top breed was Hazy Match, then the daughter of Hazy Match and Heather, and then a grand uh, grandson of Heather, mm-hmm. also called Eckley Chance, who's by who is by Glen Carrick Prince. Mm-hmm. So that mare has had quite a, she has a son. I'm just trying to think now. Yep, I think Turning Leaf. Yep, there's a son there as well who's there in Germany as well. So she's been a prolific mare over in Germany and she's by Monaghan's Town. I have to double check here now. Monaghan's Town Fionn. I was going to say Monaghan's Town Fionn. I went up because I remember herself and uh, Nara Valley Lauren around the same time. I said, gosh, we can't keep two. Monaghan's town Fionn's you know we have two of the same maybe we should sell one so that's how Heather came up for sale and then Hannah was um, that's her actually showing at the Midlands back in that's over 10 years that's about 10 years old now that photo is and uh, so we were at the Midlands show and she came second there and I showed her in hand and then we sold her on as a broodmare and Pori Kane you had her and now she's with of Connemara Pony Ireland, he's a equine agent, and he sold her on then to Kylemore Abbey. So she's one of their foundation mares in Kylemore Abbey, and actually her son went on to win at the Midlands Show this year, ten years later. So it's lovely for me to see that the next generation that we're breeding them well enough that when they're crossed by the the next owners, that they're coming out as winners as well. So it is lovely. Yeah. So that is so. Yeah, one was a, an important mayor in Germany, Heather, and Hannah now is living her life in Kylemore Abbey, and I hope that's where she stays. And it's lovely, actually, that for me, it's lovely that such a, a visitor attraction now has one of the Nara Valley ponies. Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. Yeah, it's amazing. It's lovely. So, so here we hope and. Uh, she was born in 2009, daughter of Audrey Kunga, crossed with Glenn Carrick Prince down the bottom left-hand corner. And there's a photo there of her in 2009 as a foal and then as a four-year-old on a very, very wet day in Cork, going in-hand champion there. And we've had many happy days in Cork with her, actually. She's been twice in-hand champion and twice ridden champion there in the past 10 years. And then... um. So we showed her in hand and she did quite well in Clifton. Actually, she was always like, you know, like her dam, fourth, fifth or sixth. That was kind of generally where she was placed. So overall, OK, you'd be happy enough with it. And there then I decided we put put her under saddle, you know, just to that we had been doing it actually for nearly since about 2008. Susan Cleary came on board and Susan produced a lot of them and then she retired and then Pauline Dahl has been producing since. But just in 2018, I think Pauline did so many in the roster. She uh, got Hazel Hart to ride her and Hope went on to, and it got on great. Hazel and Hope did. And they went reserve ridden champion in 2018. And I was just absolutely thrilled because I've believed in that. I believe in Hope so much. Mm-hmm. I really believe in her. I I thought she was gorgeous from the day she was born. And uh, she was after 2018, then we we're out in 2019 with no joy. He's, but it didn't matter. I mean, we had wonderful days in 2018. She was ridden champion at Cork and she was ridden champion Connemara at Dungarvan. And then we won, we were reserve junior champ, reserve ridden champion at 
Clifton and then we brought her, she had a fall and brought her out of retirement for this year in 2023. And Pauline was produ- was riding her this time. Um, and they just had wonderful days. They were, she was reserve in-hand champion at Cork. She was ridden champion at Cork. And then we brought her on. We qualified. The first day we went out, we qualified. You know, as I always feel, that first qualifier for Dublin, and Alicia probably attest to this as well, everybody, I feel it's like a charge down to Wexford, down to Fourth Mountain for this first qualifier that we're all trying to get to Dublin. And uh, she topped her qualifier at the age of 14, brought back out of retirement just in May. So it was fantastic. And she came... um, she was that's her riding in the championship there with Pauline, and it was just wonderful. It was wonderful memories. My parents were there for it as well, and it was wonderful that they were there. And it was great. It was great. Just so again, like, what are the qualities that you see coming through? Like, if you think back to Canal Lauren, and you know, and then through, well, yeah, the, this and is Ira, and you know, yeah, this is where I like. Has she bone? Yes. Has she type? Yes. Has she got movement? Yes. You know, she's taking, hope ticks so many boxes for me as a broodmare, mm-hmm. you know, and she's very similar actually to her dam. If you look over in the top left and if you look at the one in the 2013, they, they're very, they're quite similar. Like she's mm-hmm. ordering the higher is quite young. I think she's about three or four in that top left. Mm-hmm. And there's hope as a three or four year old. And as you can see, she put on a bit more bone. She put up a bit more bone. Actually, she got older. Mm-hmm. So, and for me, she's more kind of like the older style Connemara, which is that little bit short coupled, uh, very pony type. But in for me, Nara Valley Hope is what Connemaras are about. Okay. I, I just think she's a lovely brood mare and I look forward to breeding a few more. And this is, she's only had one fall to date. We uh, brought her to Tullery Chieftain and... She's had one filly, yearling filly, and that's her down on the bottom right-hand corner, the grey. And that is the great-granddaughter of our foundation mayor. Mm-hmm. So all the way back to where we started at the very end of Yeah, that. 30 years later. Yeah, back to where we started. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like for people, you know, you can look through the 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 images of the animals over the years and kind of see that that um that's kind of, that that transition and of of this filly here you know like when you saw her as a foal and you see her you know now like what do you think are her best qualities or how do you feel like the cross has come so i think it's uh she's first foal and of the mayor and she just uh, she's coming on slowly she has got stronger since she was a foal so I'm I'm really interested to see. I think we won't really fully know what we've got until she's three. Sometimes they land on the ground and, you know, they just, you know, and sometimes they just take a little bit of time to develop. And she has come on, she's put up more bone. She's become more type since she has been a foal. Like she looked very pony as a foal, but not necessarily Connemara pony. Whereas now she's looking more Connemara pony. So I'm hoping that that will continue, but we're just going to have to wait and see. So then this, this is Harmony. This is Audrey Nahira crossed with I Love You Melody. And you want to know when do we sell? This pony was sold as a three-year-old at the sales in Clifton. So often, most of the time we'd sell, we wouldn't really, we'd produce on the ones that we might be keeping. Or we might produce them for a year or two, you know, until they're five and then they'll be sold. So the likes of the mares that we're keeping, we will. We want to build up black type so that they have so that when somebody's coming to look at their foals that they say, oh, she has jumped to grade C. She must have some ability. Oh, she's one in Dublin. Yeah, that's that's good. Or she's one in Clifton or, you know, that they have like with the equivalent of the racing horse, that they have some black type. Now, this filly was sold as a three-year-old at Clifton and I didn't know what happened. And then the lady 
Well, the lady who did buy her sold her on. I thought she was keeping her, but she didn't. And uh, she went to a girl and they have been campaigning her. And she, in 2018, she was reserve in-hand champion to, it's Joe Burke Stallion, uh, Banks Timber. I'm nearly certain it's Banks Timber. But I'm open to correction at the Royal Cheshire County Show. And like they use her for cross country for hacking out. And they also, their dream was to get to Hoy's. And they did. They got there in 2022. So it's great. And they're hoping to breed from that mayor now as well. Mm -hmm. And she's by I Love You Melody. Mm -hmm. Which actually leads us nicely into the next one mm. with Alicia. Yeah. Also by I Love, I Love You Melody. So um, and yeah. just to say to anybody, you know, that might be out there looking at clocks at this point in the evening, we are a little bit like the last one with uh, back in May with 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 Philippa and Hannah. I'm going to bring this to its conclusion. If people need to go from us this evening, they can. We'll have the recording. Um, hopefully that people can step back into it later again as well. But we'd love to keep you with us if you if you're if you're if you're game to stay with us. But we're going to finish the conversation out. So, um, Alicia, tell us a little bit about this one here. Um, so this is a new um pony that came to me this year. It's one I'm kind of I'm quite excited for um in the future. He is a stallion that um he was with me for a couple of months there. Um he qualified for Dublin and actually ended up finishing third in the performance class. He it, to me he's really exciting for a couple of reasons. One, he he's a he's a son of I Love You Melody who recently passed away um, and he to me he has a lot of really strong attributes that I would look for in a performance pony and in a Connemara pony he's really really strong deep chest um, and again he has just this athletic powerful jump like you, you can see like in the in the photos there of him jumping from Dublin like he's very very clean jumper very neat and he has an awful lot of power in in his back end, um. I, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what he can he can do um in the future with me, but like that you can see, once we developed like that relationship there, you can see that the desire he has to please and and go out and and try do his best for for you, um you know like Dublin came probably just about at the right time for him like he he was only really starting to get into his stride at that time but you could really see how how he handled the course how he handled the the atmosphere and you know all the different challenges that the, the course threw at him and um, it really just shows that the, the I suppose the star potential that he would have um going forward hopefully <laughs> And and just maybe like in the sense of, um, you know, working with a stallion as a producer, you know, from your perspective, like, does it does it bring more challenges in the sense of managing him at home and managing the transportation and all that end of it, or is he just like? Um, yeah, it can, it can, it, it depends on the individual um stallion, you know, obviously some of them are, are a little bit more stallion-y than others um, when they're out. It's just something you have to be more aware of. Um, I think when you're competing, you know you, you know what you're on, whereas people around you may not be as aware of what you're sitting on. And yeah. so it's just something you have to be more aware of when you're producing them. And, um, you know, I still aim, at, in terms of producing them at home, I still aim for the same thing. Like you're still looking for rideability, temperament, you know, behavior that, that they know what's expected of them and you know it, it's still it's still the same process in the sense that you, you just have to be a lot more rigid with it and be, be a lot more aware of that you are working with a stallion and, and you know they can obviously get uh, more easily distracted at times um, and sure. you know and it, and like I've had previous stallions and um, another one that won um in Dublin like he's now he's gone on and he's been he's been a kid's pony he's been sold on as a kid's uh, as a child show jumping pony you know he he had children um as young as 11 riding him and you know you would looking at him in a warm-up ring 
you would never know he was Italian. <laughs> whereas you know some of them obviously you stand back and go oh you know i need to give give them a bit of space because you just know by them and um, you know again just to be aware and we are going to talk about some crosses now but there's a couple of questions in here along the thoughts on crossing the thoroughbred with the connies and the drafts and you know any comment on the connie cross and um, somebody said that personally they've had some brilliant experience with them and they're very marketable as riding horses the welsh um, thoroughbred ID in particular so Welsh section D the thoroughbreds and the Irish draft so uh, like what's your what's your thoughts Alicia on the on the crosses and the the uh, yeah I, I really like the crosses um, again you know so this here is um, Samuel's Glenn's, Samuel Glenn's lad and um, he's like he was he was pre TIH I suppose classification but he is your true TIH kind of um type of animal. Um, he was a sixteen two um sport horse that was by a Connemara pony, Calafinish Martin, and then out of um ma- a master imp mare, and she was she was a master imp crossed with an Irish draft. Um, he, for me coming from Connemara's, I could see all the pony attributes in him, um, mm-hmm. and it was quite funny because when you would take him out. A lot of people that would be more used to the master imp breeding would look at him and go, oh, my God, he's master imp. But to me, when I looked at him, I was like, oh, my God, he's Califidish Martin. Um, so he he had all of those qualities coming through, you know, like you can see there, he, like the step on him, you know, like he he had serious step. But he he also had really, really good bone. You know, he wasn't too light. Um he was very athletic. He he brought through, you know, the, the jumping line of Car- Califinish Martin. And then obviously um, Master Imp was very um, influential um, with jumpers and eventers. You know, you could see the, the two crosses come together in that, in that he combined, like, the power and scope of the horse. But he also had that, that pony brain and that, like, he was very, very clever. Like, you know, he, he could he could get himself out of a lot of trouble. Like he was, he was very quick and very pony like, but in a 16, two version. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think it was, I think it's, it's really good when it works well. I think it works really, really well. Um, and, but you just have to be kind of aware of, you know, again, what do you want to produce when you're breeding them? What you're aiming for. And I'm kind of going to kind of ask you the same, a similar question to what I've asked before in the sense of with with this, and we'll come to another one in a, in a moment, but more, more particularly with this, because we can see the full breeding in front of us. Um, and when we compare mm-hmm. this cross to your canny, to your draft, and I suppose, you know, A, the competitive opportunities, and B, the... Yeah the market options how does that then sit yeah so um the market for this fella like he i think i think the tih is on on like that the, the native crosses um open up a lot of markets for you because they they have they tend to have like that little bit of blood because there tends to be uh, maybe a bit of thoroughbred in there so they, they open up markets where, you know, they need a little bit bit of blood in, in the sense that they need to be a little bit more blood for the to be more competitive in eventing. But they also keep a lot of that um, native temperament and, and I suppose, um, willing willingness and attitude and just forgiveness for an amateur rider. But they also have that little bit more quality if you are going on and competing um, in some of those sports that you know you need a little bit more step or you need a, a little bit more blood to kind of be competitive um, so I think it, it opens up kind of two kind of markets in the sense that it gives you that amateur but it's like a competitive amateur edge as well and um, that wants to go on and, and you know show jump or or event or do whatever that they, they, they're very versatile um, a very versatile animal and like that, you have also the Connemara and Draft Cross is now starting to, I think, become quite popular. And it's, you know, it's producing a lot of um, either like small hunter type of animals, you know, that they're, they're kind of like 
they look like this guy, but they're a bit smaller. He was about 16 too, but they're that 15 to kind of 16 hand size that again, they are, you know, the family horse, everyone can ride it. You know, it's it, a child coming up and um, off ponies onto horses, but yet they still have that kind of that pony nature to help, you know, to help their rider an awful lot more and um, that you would see in, in kind of warm blood horses. Um, and, you know, then the, 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 the cob kind of, the they're also producing cobs with the, the draft cross on the Connemara cross. You know, they're, they're getting the, the heavier draft and getting plenty of bone, but you're still getting that athletic nature coming through from the Connemara. So it, it's adding a very interesting mix to the cob classes and now cob working hunter classes as well. There's another question in here that I put you took before we put on on to the next horse here. Um, can you please maybe pay reference to color? Um, for example, Dunn and Bay sell well, but don't do so well in the show ring, according to the 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 person here in their opinion. Um, also yeah. pink nose markings or white hoof not as desirable in the show ring as well. Um, yeah. So in Connemara's it would be showing traditionally is, is they are grey um, in the sense that they tend to do better. Now it is getting, I, I've, I've found in recent years, it's getting more um, diverse in the colours. So I would have produced some duns and when they when they started their careers, you know, it was very unusual to see a dun in the ring. They would stand out like a sore thumb, whether it was for a good reason or a bad reason. Um, but, you know, they kind of got a foothold. The Duns are kind of like now the next kind of most accepted colour, I suppose, um, in the show ring. But you can see like the, there's an awful lot more like the stallion I referred to earlier that um, has now gone on um, show, as a child's show jumper. He was a roan. He was a strawberry roan. Um, now, he never competed in the ridden classes, but as a performance pony, you know, he done his job. As far as I'm concerned, as a performance animal, if they do their job properly, <laughs> It doesn't matter what color they are. I do think Dunn, as, as a selling point, Dunn seems to be really, really popular in the showing. It has to be like, they have to be a really good Dunn, <laughs> you know, but they, the majority are gray, unfortunately, because you have to do a lot more cleaning mm -hmm. um, when you're producing for the show ring. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Dennis Town Lady then, um, which is, the last one of yours that we're going to look at this evening and um, talk to us a little yeah. bit here. Obviously, we we don't have full reading for this um this mare. Yeah, so I, I included this mare because because she was a half draft. So I kind of I had the half Connemara and I wanted to kind of show a half draft. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't actually know her full breeding. Um, but this mare came to me, I'd say about six or seven weeks before Dublin. Um, having never shown before, she was kind of, she was actually one of these um kind of all round ponies. She was or a horse. She's a horse, and um, she was kind of like pony club for an older an older child was kind of coming off ponies and onto a horse. So she would have done a little bit of like pony club eventing and stuff, um, with her owners, and so she came to me initially for um producer to say for sale just because she had kind of gone out into the field and hadn't done a whole lot um, and just to get her back into work and get her going so when she came to us I kind of went oh actually you know what this is potentially a really nice hunter mare for um showing so we aimed her at the um lightweight hunter mare class in Dublin um and so she went on she went on to finish second in her class and then she went into the main ring in the championship um, and absolutely went fantastic. She loved the gallop down the long side um, with the judges. And they actually ended up putting her reserve champ mayor champion. Um, and she ca actually came up over her class winner, which would be quite unusual. Oh, yeah. But um, she really came came to her own, I suppose, in, in the atmosphere of the main ring. you know like I see you you've um, ridden her side saddle as well too like does that does that in your opinion add much to the marketability to the options or you know like what um 
terms of, of yeah at looking at this lady as to where you see her end home and what you see her doing for her lifetime ahead what what what's your your picture in your head of her I think she could really be one of those um all round horses like for um like a competitive amateur to go out do riding club you know do fun rides do sh- do showing to a good level do a bit of show jumping do a bit of eventing she she is though that real all round type and again that's coming through in the breeding um, and in her temperament you know like she she's a fantastic temperament for a mare who had never shown never seen the inside of a show ring to come in to Dublin within six weeks of being produced for showing and literally to go in go in and just stroll around take it all in her stride that is the mark that is I think that's the market and that's the key selling point I suppose for all of these um, natives and native crosses is just their great attitude to work and and their desire to I suppose please their rider and and do what they can to help them mm-hmm. well thank you very much for introducing all of those to us we will be back to you Alicia before we finish up but we're going to move now on okay. back across to the Nile the Nile Val- I did all right with my yeah, no. Naira earlier and now I'm falling over my absolute English, which is Nile Barry Lauren. I'm so sorry, me. Um, right. <laughs> so this is yeah. this is the eighth poll of Canal Lauren and her we're gonna talk about her progeny. So she had five foals between 2008 and 2018. Yes. And three of those were fillies and two of them were colts. So um yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, you can just, there's a picture actually of each one of our five progeny and they're going down um, <laughs> nearly in order they're, when they're, they're born they're actually. Marked, they're numbered here. So yeah, one, so, one, yeah. so the top one is Nara Valley Bell and a sh- a shoulder in hand and Susan Cleary had been producing four bow rows and very successfully for us under saddle. So we decided to do the same with Bell. And she's by Hazy Match, the stallion over in Germany. It was then brought over here. And uh, she was ridden champion at Clifton in 2013. Then number two, then you have Nair Valley Charlie, who's by Glen Carrick Prince. And it was great. He did really well. He was sold, bought as a three-year-old by the Bell Heathers. And they produced him. Raskin, how did, I think that was actually through Facebook that that, I, I, I think that sale, that's how that one went. Mm-hmm. and uh, he ended up his highest place. He went over to see him. He was produced, sold on to Sarah Parker, and she produced him under saddle, and he came third in Hoys the one year he, we were there. You know, he was, he did compete again, and then he was competing in the junior division, and I think, I'm nearly certain he won the junior division in 2016. I was a friend of mine sent on the video, but that's him. He also qualified for Olympia before it was called the London International Horse Show. Then below that is Beezy, and we still have bought back that mare, sold her and bought her back. And that's her competing at uh, Clifton with her pre- with her, oh, her then owner, Elena Hackett, down in Tremor. Fortunately, that mare didn't go outside the country, thankfully, because we lost her down prematurely and uh, I nearly lost the whole line. So we managed to buy her back, um, which was great. So we have her at home. And then to our right then with Susan, again, Susan Cleary, we had wonderful time together. We went around for about eight years. I think every show from Dublin to Clifton to Cork and Bano Rathangan and, and everything in between. And her highest placing out, she is by Tampa Brady Farm Wee. So you're bringing back in jumping again. And she was reserve working hunter champion to Leisha's pony, Blackwood Fernando. So the unbeatable and uh, yeah, so he was there in 2016 and then Susan retired and then Pauline took over and we had a wonderful time. Pauline was produced Nair Valley Count, who's by Glen Carrick Knight, son of Yanis. And he won in Clifton as a four year old. He was second in Dublin as a four year old as well. It was a wonderful year. He was Supreme Champion Pony at, at Lone. Everywhere he went, it was unbelievable. Everywhere he went, Pauline and himself 
were absolutely wonderful. She's a super producer. If you give her the pony, as in bone type, quality, pedigree, Colleen will get you there. And we had a wonderful year with him and it was just fantastic. And he sold on and he's now being produced by the Glins and they're doing very well with him as well. And I wish them continued success with them. So they were the five. Testament to the line as well, in terms of all we've discussed so far, the amount of success that there has been with. Yes, it is. That's what I say. Like it's they say like does pedigree matter? I think this is the proof that pedigree does matter. So yeah, and there's just a selection of uh, photos there showing um, showing um. I was going to call him Count Charlie as a fold. That's him back in 2009. And actually the banner photo I have for Nair Valley, uh, Connemara's was uh, three heads looking over a hedge taken by Susan again. And would you believe it? And it was before any of them won when they were two and three years of age and all of them went on to be champions somewhere. Okay. Either are a winner at Hoy's, champion at Clifton. Yeah, and two champions at Clifton is extraordinary. Now this is, Nair Valley Lawrence Bell's first bowl and this is her back in 2013 and uh, yeah, she's crossed there with Hazy Match this is when he's here in Ireland when he's older mm. and it was a lovely quality and this is another key thing when you're saying at the ring people kind of get fixated on colour yeah grey is the predominant colour and you know, you see it winning more often because it is the most predominant colour in the breed. But the most important thing when you have, when you're looking, if you look at any of the winners, whether it be in hand or under saddle, they're all quality. They've, one thing is throughout them all, and that's quality. And quality, and that's, you need quality to get, because the standard has improved and improved and improved. What's your, what's your definition of quality, Neve? Quality uh is a com it's the magic combination you've got presence you've got type you've got bone you've got movement and you need all those ingredients mm -hmm. like it's it's that fine line where you don't have too much bone and you have enough bone mm -hmm. and it's actually it's in proportion to the body that the pony has on top mm -hmm. that's what i mean by quality that the limbs underneath the animal match the body of the animal that they're not too light and not too strong mm -hmm. as if they're a bit too strong they can look a bit plain which and leads us nice, nice, it leads us nicely to here and why why we have a thoroughbred stuck in the middle of the yeah we do hurricane run I, I, this is a really important i know people would say why is there a thoroughbred in the middle of this because um I was at the Irish Derby and I was there with my sister and her now husband and they're heavily involved in the Thorbirds. And I remember I was looking at Hurricane Ron. He went on to win the Irish Derby and many other races, but that particular, I saw him in the flesh that day and I saw him in the pre-parade ring. Pre -parade pre -parade, ring. Yeah. And I was looking at him and I'd been at so many seminars and I was breathing away and, you know, they were, they were talking about bone. But I, I, I'd seen a lot of the Connemara's and the ones that had a lot of bone seemed to lack a bit of quality. And there he was looking at Hurricane Run. I said, I said to myself, this fella has bone and he has quality. You can do it. And I set out and I said, right. And that always stuck in my mind. You can have the two. You now go and breed ponies that have bone and have quality. So, and I, I really appreciate that people are still with us. I know, yeah. So, we, are, um, we are reaching a conclusion shortly. So. Yeah, so if somebody was asking about Duns, here we go, back in 2006, the main photo is from 2006, and uh, that day was a very special day. I, I did a lot of showing in hand uh, until about a decade ago. I kind of semi more or less retired since. But um, this was uh, Nara Valley Kestrel. And actually, this one is, really, is kind of similar kind of breeding. If you go back to Alicia's stallion, the one I love you, Jazz, who was uh, by, out of a mare called Cashelaine Chloe, he was by Hoiberg's Bright Star. Now, but this, this, is a, this is a different mare line now. We've moved mare line. Yeah, yeah. this is another mare. Now, we bought this mare from Horry Kynes as well. So he really helped us get, I mean, he, he, he we bought our foundation mares basically from Horry Kynes. So we're, you know, we had a great start and he was great to help us with, 
suggesting stallions, but she we showed her in hand. She won in hand twice in Dublin, uh, but we used to you can see it in the top right. That was what we did at home. That's my sister and I, and we used to do a lot of hacking out. And that's uh, and our, the two mares are there. And both of them were under saddle and were produced by Peter Maloney for jumping. And you can see that she did jumping away as well at mm-hmm. the time. Yeah, so far. So, yeah. But this is a mare. She won in hand twice in Dublin. Once as a three-year-old and we had another mare that won the same day as her Furbo Rose. And would you believe it? That's why I was so excited last this year we had two Nair Valley ponies qualified for Dublin. I said this hasn't happened since we were last in Dublin many, many years ago. So we were a long time waiting. And here we go with the bays. Now this is Nair Valley Kestrel. So on the right hand side are three of her progeny. Uh, the first one is Nair Valley Finch, who is a uh, daughter of Yanis, was ridden champion at Clifton 2012. Mm, and when and then, back to yeah. my moment, yeah. Yeah, so there's there. This answers your bays. She's kind of more red braid, the top one. The middle one then is Nara Valley Fancy, and she's luckily has stayed in the country as well. She's in Lismore with the, the nobles. And she is by Fairy Hill Tomboy. And she that's a photo when she went uh, champion working hunter pony at John Garvin in 2018. And actually, with champion Connemara and champion working hunter, both Nara Valley's the same day. And it was lovely because. Dungarvan show is a good standing show. And then underneath that then is uh, Nair Valley, frankly, another John, and he was sold to Germany. And he has uh, a son still in Germany now. So as you can see, and she actually only had one grey, would you believe it? But that's no great surprise because Nair Valley Kestrel's dam was fancy Phyllis and it's bred by Martin O'Donnell. And if you go back to that pedigree, there was every colour. There was mm-hmm. chestnuts, there was bays, there were duns. There was a lot of colour in the background. And we never thought we'd get so many bays and duns, but there you go, we did. And they're lovely. So then... And here we have Nara Valley Finch, the daughter of uh, Kestrel and Yanis. Now, Yanis was a prolific stallion. Henry O'Toole brought him here to Ireland. And luckily, he did bring him here to Ireland. And there's some lovely progeny here by him. And he won in Dublin. Yanis did. Uh, I'm open to... I, I, he definitely won in Dublin. I think he won in Clifton as well. Beautiful. He was a super dressage pony uh, in Sweden. And we got Nair Valley Finch. And she was ridden champion in uh, 2012. Susan Cleary produced her as well. As well as Belle and as Beck and Forber Rose. And then we crossed Finch. She's had a few different folds since... And we the most recent crossing was with Gory Moore Diamond, who won there in Clifton. And he actually is a son of our because it's a separate the Don line is comp- the Don Mayor is a completely different line what from the previous. All, all the other ones were yeah. they're all coming from the village line originally. Mm-hmm. This one is Nara Valley Kestrel coming. It's a different line completely. And Gory Moore Diamond is actually a son of Nara Valley Leah. And Nara Valley Leah is a daughter of Canal Lauren. And that is actually Gory Moore Diamond there as a foal beside her, Diamond as a foal. So for and those who thought we'd lost the plot, there was a reason for bringing, the, for bringing you on the journey of the second line as well at this hour of the evening. Yes, so. and then the bay filly, the bay yearling down there is Nara Valley Emerald and... She is also a great granddaughter of Canal. our foundation mayor, Canal Lawrence. So the two yearlings go back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. And all of them, they have lovely temperaments, all of them. And I don't see people. OK, in the rings, I don't think that greys are favoured over duns or bays. It's just that there's more greys in the herd anyway. Mm-hmm. And... It's the predominant colour and it's the one that you see most frequently. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't say it's favoured over others. And pink nose as well. You know, pink noses are there. You could, we have a little pink splash there on Finch. She was bay with the white stripe down the front of her face and it didn't disadvantage her. But she was and is. And she was a photo that she's just, she's quality. 
She's the smaller of the mares. That's, she is. Yeah. yeah, she is smaller, the smaller of the mares as well. Mm-hmm. And just like uh, this, this mare here, we didn't pay a lot of attention to her in the start. What, what she has produced, what did I say? She has had seven foals between 2007 and 2022, one colt and six fillies. Um, and two of those and that is the themselves as well yeah yes there's two Anina has so thanks Anina for that photo she sent it on Anina's below in West Cork and she has two full sisters to Gory Moore Diamond mm-hmm. as well and am I right was there a connection here back to Alicia as well Um. yeah so I was producing him Diamond there at the beginning of last season in four ridden classes so I had him for a few months there with, during the season. So what perspective would you offer on his attributes and character and all of that? Um, yeah, so he he's really quality animal. Um, you know, he he's great bone, great temperament. Um he would be one that would kind of be produced on in terms of like either a ridden or a working hunter, in the sense that like he has the breeding um and and the ability to go on and be a performance pony in terms of working hunter performance um, and equally you know as he's already shown I suppose in the in-hand class in Clifton he would have the potential to be a very um, good ridden pony as well um, in the show ring mm-hmm. so this last slide here um, Neve. Um... oh my god yes brings together I suppose the imagery of the transition since yes Canal it's working Lauren. from left to right so Canal Lauren is there the two photos of Canal Lauren uh thankfully my father had those photos we found them daughter Audrey Nahira then her daughter Nara Valley Hope um well I should have said and if you go up to the top right there's Nara Valley Leah who is um, of Gorymore Diamond and the, put the two bays and we have a bay here so am I afraid to breed a bay definitely not the bays were all in fashion I would say at Dublin and Clifton this year I mean there was a bay was a winner of the novice ridden class and the stallion in the ridden class the second placed stallion was also a bay and two bays won in Clifton as well so I, it's just you don't see them as much. That's, um, and the done. So I wouldn't. It's lovely to see a bit of color. You stand out anyway when you're inside in the ring with a bit of color, a bit different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I can see that a purporter of the Kerry Bog Pony is 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 looking to get a word in for the Kerrys for the natives as well too. Um, and wondering, are we aware of their presence? We are. Yes. yes. I suppose, look at were- this evening was about. You know, I suppose those that are more inclined to be in that ridden market and that that production. Well, market. I think the carry bog pony actually could really be developed because you say, like Alicia, you were saying that you were trying to find a Connemara pony for yourself with the thirteen handers or the thirteen twos. Yeah, you can't get them like as like a carry bog pony. Cork Summer Show provide classes for them, and they're in, and they have a native breed pony championship as well, and they were there this year. So I think it's they're a new enough society, as in I think, in that they're less than twenty years old. The Kerry Bog Pony, so they need a little bit of time to get going, and they market them as being a small child's pony, ridden first ridden pony, ideal for lead rein. You know, there's they're not forgotten about it. They're we know they're there. It's just they don't have the same profile as Connemara's and drafts. But look at how long the Connemara's and drafts have been as organised societies, I should say, have been there and they're campaigning for their own breed. So I'm sure the Kerry Bog Pony will be as prolific as the Connemara in due course. But it does need help. And just just need to back you up there a little bit in terms of, in recent years, I actually have come across um, the Kerry Bog Ponies actually in children's showing classes. Yeah. Again, they're not in specific Kerry Bog classes, but it would probably be really great for the pony if there was classes promoted for them because it would increase the standard and, and promote and them more, more as the Connemara's and drafts. Yeah, and mm-hmm. as, as the Connemara's and drafts have been produced and brought on, 
it would be great to see that the Kerry Boggs would get this, I suppose, get the same um, opportunities as the other native breeds have. Yes. And I think probably if I was in the Kerry Bog Pony Society, I'd be definitely canvassing Dublin that they would get a class or get a parade and start there, get the, give them a more national profile. And that's where I would start anyway. But. So ladies, we're, we're, we, I, I will put one last one. Um, I, I'm just noticing and look at um, those who, who send emails to me. It's like, it's hard for me to keep on top of, of Q and A's here and emails as well too. But um, there was a um, one that came in around, um, you know, that so many people are trying to produce the successful jumper and venture to maximize their returns. Um, you know, the animals that don't make the grade, maybe not being as suitable as leisure animals um, and not maybe having the quite sensible temperament that's needed for the leisure rider. And there's a question like, is this becoming the case with the Connemara? Is it harder now to find a sensible, sensible um, family pony as such? Well, I, I, I can stand yeah. over all our own breed anyway. They are all sensible. They have a lovely, they've always had a lovely temperament every generation all through them they've always been easy to handle it's not my full-time job it's uh my hobby my passion probably and they have to be of easy temperament because they're leisure horses so the vast majority in my opinion of people who are riding natives particularly purebred natives like Connemara's or drafts are leisure riders and probably don't ride any more than three times a week so they need something that's quiet that can if they have to put it out in the field and can't ride for two weeks they can bring it in and get up with it and get on it and move on. So native breeds, I think, are just have great temperaments. So I don't think that that's really, for me, in my opinion, in my experience, mm -hmm. that hasn't really been an issue. And Eve, you know, you've brought us on your breeding journey from Canal Lauren <laughs> all the way through to, you know, the two fillies now. Like, what have been the key learnings for you, like your family, you as a breeder? What what have been the key things that you've taken out from that journey um, as lessons to you to bring forward into your next your next years of breeding? Um, oh, excuse me. Well, yeah, I hope there's a few more chapters left. Yeah, yeah, I suppose it was very, yeah, hurricane. That's why I got you to put in hurricane run. That proved, yeah, quality, quality. One word, but you need to start, you need a good mare. When I say a good mare, that, you know, you're starting on the right foot, that she is suitable as a brood mare, as in has a good temperament, has done, like with Alicia, has been produced under saddle, like what we did with our mares, and they show that they've right ability and manners and they can do something. And then you look at your mare and say, right, nothing's perfect. And you find pick out the strong traits, pick out where there's room to improve. And then you go and you look for a stallion who will hopefully improve your mare. And when I say improve, just come that will come that little bit better than your mare or a good bit better than your mare. If, But my advice, start with a good mare and pedigree is very important and that they have black type, that they've achieved something as well, I think is very important. And then, I didn't do any of it all alone. I got great help from my family and all the producers along the way and all those who helped the producers as well. So, and I hope that Hazel and Pauline and Susan got as much enjoyment out of it as we did. It was great and it was wonderful and we've such happy memories and I hope we've and a few more going. chapters to write. You're going, you're still going. And Alicia coming to you, you know, to wrap, wrap up your end of it I suppose you know from your seat as somebody who has a lot of years of production ahead of you and you're still on the hunt out there for your next your next big you know success story like what's your yeah. advice to the breeders of let's say like we've had a lot of conversation about the Connies Let, let's talk about the, the the draft and we'll say the mm -hmm. the native crosses like what what would you appeal most to breeders of those types to focus attention on for the next, for your next star, for your next? next. 
yeah like it, it's again looking at the pedigree and looking at the breeding and you know aiming ha have your own aim obviously like all of us come from our own with our own perspectives to what we want um in an animal and and again depending on what we're competing in um but you know when it comes down to it no matter what you're competing in whether you're amateur or professional you know it, as long as you're competing you need to have something like as me said with a little bit of quality whether that is you know movement they have to have good confirmation true to type obviously if you're if you're going with um the natives um and then you know with the native crosses whether you're aiming at a cob or you're aiming at a hunter type um you know you're 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 looking for those i suppose um strong traits that will come through in, in the breeding and you know personally i like performance so i do like something that is athletic and um, particularly then like in the drafts you know there there's there is a push on like the, the the more athletic drafts but i think we need to be very careful that we're not losing that bone and mm -hmm. um, you know because then you're you're losing the draft type you do need bone mm -hmm. and quality for them to to continue the draft line and continue to be able to compete against mm -hmm. i suppose the the, the warm bloods and, and the other breeds that have that blood but you know they're obviously bringing the advantage of their their great temperaments and you've shown some nice examples of that this evening yeah. It, it, can, it can it can be done it is being done and it will be done yeah and, and we are being partially i don't know whether we've been partially scolded or what here by um by an uh, an anonymous attendee for not mentioning huff wall separation disease so that's another i think that's another day's it's another, another, day. our, another it's argument not, for another it's, day. Another, it's another day's work and we are of course conscious of it and it has been mm -hmm. it has been touched on in other webinars on this forum but look what we had we had a lot that we were trying to pack into the evening at you know the story to bring so apologies to that attendee for not having done that on this occasion but look at we might get back to having a whole other webinar on that topic another day so i am really appreciative to both of you ladies um i'm also really appreciative to those who have stuck with us for the whole two hours um thank you for for your attendance and a huge thanks to everybody for all of the questions comments and all the rest of it that have come in um i think i've managed to get the most of them it's kind of hard to split my attention across the two screens but i hope i've managed to get them the most of them in there and um, a, a huge appreciation to you ladies for the preparations for this webinar as well, too, because there was um, an, a nice bit of all of that to put the story together on screen for everybody as well, too. So the rude machine that Zoom is, um, once I hit this red button, it's good night to all. But thanks to everybody for their um for their involvement here this evening. And our net my next webinar is um next month i actually don't have my diary out in front of me here as i usually have but it's um i think it's on the first tuesday of the month or next month but we'll have that advertised in due course and wendy thanks very much for inviting inviting ourselves both of us on inviting me on inviting yes. you on thank you it was an honor to be asked to asked off, it was a pleasure to have you so, thank um, you yeah, she's a great woman for it. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Them all in. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. Very um, important. Good, good, good night, everybody. At and home. thanks to the audience for sticking with us. Yeah, kudos <laughs> to you. Really appreciate that. And um, look, uh, we'll be we'll be chatting. All right. Thank you. Good night and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.